Town Hall with a trailer from the Unbreakable Virgin Islanders. Um, that's a revised trailer. That's for the, we have a distribution deal that's coming out. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the world is now gonna see our resilience and who we are. With no further ado, let's introduce our panel for tonight. Guys, this was the first day USVI that features an all male panel. Now folks ask me why. We've had 45 murders, um, homicides for the year in the US Virgin Islands. When this began, we launched this Dare USVI um, town hall during the pandemic because I said, you know what? It's time for us as a people to have a honest, heartfelt discussion about where are we going as a community? It was amazing. The first two town halls, we saw 10,000 people tune in every episode. This last one, I wanted to bring the men of our community to, together because the violence has primarily affected our young men in the territory. And I may not be a rocket science, but I think a lot of our young men need brothers like ourselves to connect to, to be a guide, to offer some mentorship. So this final panel, with, we are featuring Julius Jackson, Olympic boxer, celebrity chef. Julius is just a stand-up brother man that's been doing a lot of great work with youth over at my brother's workshop, working with at-risk at kids. Just a great guy that I believe our kids could turn to as, as a role model. We have Digby Shradaran, um, another strong dynamic brother from St. Croix. Um, I was drawn to Digby, man, because as we look at our narrative in our community, Digby's one of our young, promising entrepreneurs. And I think that's so critical because if we look at our issues, lack of economic opportunities. And Digby has been a trailblazer with his restaurants and creating a nucleus for other young entrepreneurs coming from our community. We have Pastor Monroe's. The esteemed Pastor Mon Monroe's has been here for every town hall. Um, why I'm inspired by Pastor Monroe's is because as a religious figure, his message, his, his, his sermons, in my opinion, speak to a young, progressive voice. You know, when people think of ministry, man, they think judgment, they think, oh, this guy's coming to criticize. But with Pastor Monroe's ministry, I see a guy who is connecting God to, to the streets, you know, and um, he's been a great advocate and a force when combating gun violence in our community. He's based in Brooklyn. That's where his, his ministry is. Um, so happy to have you, Pastor. We have Sandra James, Sandra Javon James from St. Croix. Every town hall, we have at least one law, law, lawmaker add to the discussion. I always respect our lawmakers because we put you guys in a hot seat. And um, it's critical that I look at law as you guys are the facilitators, you know? You guys are the, to create that roadmap so our people can have a prosperous future. So I'm happy to have you with us, Sandra James. We have Ross Stills. Let, 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 me, let me tell you a quick story about Ross. Ross is based in Atlanta and he has this grassroots Facebook live show called Just My Opinion. And for years, I think six years, Ross has been doing it. So, you know, I saw this one episode, Ross said, you know, on my bucket list, I want to interview Peter Bailey. I said, man, who is this guy? <laughs> so he kept at it. He kept at it. And, um, I went to Atlanta for the screening for Unbreakable in, the, that was last year in June. And man, Russ brought the people out. And I respect Russ because Russ reminds me of when I started my nightcap media company just from the grassroots, man. And um, I've seen Russ blossom and I've seen him stay the course. We might not always agree with his style, but um, what we need more in our community, man, is people who are passionate enough to talk about our issues, who don't seek scandal, who seek hope and, and, and progress. So Russ, thank you for, for jo joining the panel. The man of the hour on this panel is Roberto Robbie Smalls. I asked Robbie to come on this panel because it's safe to say that the legend of Roberto Smalls, his brothers, Spring It Juice, the Island Boys, if you know anything about the Virgin Islands, I told Robbie yesterday that you had an impact on my life. 
everyone in this panel, if you grew up in the Virgin Islands, you had an impact in our reality. Some will say for good or bad, hey, that's left for a topic of this discussion for a further date. But when we see, when we think about gangster culture and the gun violence, Smalls, you and your brothers basically were the genesis or the beginning of that. I remember growing up and, and, and your name, <laughs> when you heard the name Smalls, you didn't know whether to be scared. But the odd thing about it is growing up in our reality, we wanted to be gangster. You know, growing up in the Virgin Islands to be a male, you wanted to be tough. You wanted to be feared. Um, maybe it was, dis it was displaced. But when I was a kid, Robbie, I looked up to you guys. Many kids in our communities looked up to you guys. In the absence of doctors and lawyers, who we could see in our more working class neighborhoods in the Virgin Islands, where there'd be Freedom Hoy, where I began, Bovoni, the West, housing over there in, in, in St. Croix, what is it, Chabert, Williams Delight, these type of neighborhoods, even St. John, they have their issues. But let's just put it this way there wouldn't be a Rockefeller. There wouldn't be a Jay-Z. There wouldn't be, when you think of gang and, and, and just street culture, you have to say the name Smalls. So I brought all you brothers here tonight because we have an issue with our young brothers, man. We got an issue with our young brothers, man. They're shooting at each other like target practice. I want to begin this town hall a little bit different. I think as a people, how are we going to fix a problem if we, don't, if we don't know the history of that problem and where it began. So I'd like each one of you to give me a story or an experience or your take or your perspective of when you guys saw our island paradise go from good morning, you know, knocking on everybody's doors, you had a fight, you go in the yard and you cough. When did you guys start to see this transition from child's play the gun play. Russ, I'll start with you. Hey, good evening. Good evening, Peter. First of all, um, happy holidays to all the gentlemen on the, uh, on the panel. I think uh, you did a great job of selecting uh, the men here. I think everybody have a, a story to tell. But um, thank you again. Um, <laughs> I could, um, let's go back to 2005. 2005, I think that's when my life changed, sort of. I had a, a, a family member. Uh, he was my brother nephew, but I treat him, we, my, my brother and I have different fathers. So my brother nephew, you know, he still used to call me Unc, okay? Um, he used to live here with me in Atlanta. Everything was fine. Everything was cool. But, um, you know, how people have pride. He wasn't really working, and that was fine. He was still working with me, living with me, and used to go to work to, with me and so forth. But his pride, like, you know, he wanted his own. I understand that. So he, um, his, his, his sister told him, well, you know, come back home. Come back home, catch yourself, and you, you could always uh, go back to Saint, uh, Atlanta. Yeah. You know the states gonna always be there. So said, so so said, so done. He went ahead and did that. He was working two jobs back home, you know, trying to build his his money up and so forth. So when he come back, you know, he could be more stable. And um, it was it was Carnival, St. Thomas Carnival, two thousand and five. Now this gentleman, this young man, you know, we used to talk every week, you know, every week about, you know, he, he's coming back up, can't wait to come back up, blah, 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 blah. He was planning to come back up on September, in September, 2005. This was April, 2005. When he went back home for the two years, I think he went back home in 03. You know, he, of course he had some some beef with some, some guys that, you know, back in his school days. And he used to call and talk to me about it. And I just used to tell him, like, you know, y'all graduated, y'all done move on, some of y'all got kids. You know, you know, just, just love that. You know, just let it go, you know. But I guess, you know, with, with when you have groups and tension and stuff, you know, 
I guess they used to clash and throw words or whatever, whatever situation used to go on at events and stuff. So he used to call me all the time. I used to talk to him and so forth. So I was anxious for him to come back to get out of that environment. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not putting my head on the back for him because I wasn't there to see exactly what he was doing. But we used to talk about it. Anyway, it was uh, April 2005 carnival. It was Juve morning. I know some people on this slide probably might remember this situation. I was not there, but the night before, every night, you know, we used to talk and I used to tell him, be safe. And that night he called me before he left the house. I did not answer his call because I think I was, I was working. I was not, I was working late. And he was telling me that, I guess, you know, called to tell me he was going out, you know, whatever, whatever. Anyway, by the time I get situated and I call him, his mom answered the phone and tell me, yeah, he was calling me. But anyway, he went out. I said, well, I miss his call, blah, 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 blah. And it stick to me because that probably would have been the last phone call that I got from him. Anyway, um, didn't hear from him. He didn't call, I guess. You know how carnival is. You, you go out for the night, you stay out for juvie morning, whatever, whatever. The next day come at work, I got a call from my mom and she was asking me, did you, did you hear what happened? And I said, no, what happened? And she told me Jamal got killed. I was like, Jamal got killed? She was like, yeah. Now this, when I was doing cable, I'm in somebody uh, customer house doing that cable. And I got the call from my, you know, from my mom's and I had to step outside. And I just left, I just lose it. I just start crying. So the people, you know, they start coming out, want to know what's going on. I was just in their house and here it is. I'm boo-hooing, crying. They want to know what's going on. And I told them, you know, I got a call. You know, my nephew got killed. You know, I was I was devastated. I was devastated. I, I even had some kind of guilt in me because I missed his phone call. You know, even though I didn't have nothing to do with it, I missed his phone call. And I, I, I was like, man, like I should have got his phone call. But anyway, um, he got killed. Juve morning, Juve done. I think he was in his car going home. I guess he and these guys that have beef probably roll up to his car, probably hit his, like knock his car, I guess, to get his intent, attention. This is what I was told. He got out of the car, they start arguing. The other guy, buddy, came up, shot him dead in his chest. So I guess when he got shot, he tried to jump back in his car. He drove off. I guess he, you know, lost it and he slammed into a pole or something like that. The gentleman that was in his car, I guess his buddy, whatever, he jumped out of the car, ran. So that's that's the only thing I heard. And to this day, 2000, that was 2005, this is 2020, no one has been... Uh, arrested for that murder, you know, nothing. And um, it still bothered me to this day. I don't talk about it. I don't, you know, because it's like, you hear, you know, people, people that know what happened because this is Juve morning, you know what I'm saying? Everybody's out there walking and talking or whatever. Somebody had to see something. And that's, that's the problem that I have that with our community, that we see things, we know things, but we don't want to talk. We, we have this, oh, don't snitch mentality or, or I ain't going to say nothing because I don't want, you know, people coming to harass me. But now that we've seen, this is 2020, now that we've seen that the stigma that I'm not going to say anything to nobody is happening to their own family now. Now is the, 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 the wheels is turning. So what you thought that might not happen to you is happening to, to, to people that is being affected now. And that's the problem that we have in the Virgin Islands that I see, I, I just can't to have some kind of solution for it. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't understand why. Yeah, mute your uh, phone, mute, mute your uh, mic, Peter. Thank you, Ross. Um, yeah, we have, 
let's let's picture this, guys. We've had, I think, 45 murders thus far. We have about 106,000 people in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Where I reside in Miami, Miami-Dade County has about 2.5 million people. I think we have about 50-something murders. Compare that. Let, let, let's do the ratio here. 100,000 people, 45 murders. City with 2.5 million people, roughly the same amount of murders. You, you see what we're dealing with here. Julius, give me your give us your take on when you saw this climate of our young men just starting to look, man, quite frankly, commit genocide against each other. Um interestingly enough, um I feel like I'm in in that generation transition state. And I feel like I, I'm right there um i graduated high school in 2005 and um coming up in middle school you know going to Cancrine, uh things were tough you know uh you know i was i was one of the guys that get picked on from the bullies and the, uh yeah believe it or not <laughs> from the bullies and you know all the all the, the big money at the school and all the gangsters at the school i was the one that kind of you know they'll kind of pick on me but nothing was super violent really you know, in middle school, there'll be some fights and things like that. Uh, but we ain't really hearing about man dying, you know. Uh, but when I got to high school, um, I would say maybe 10th and 11th grade, um, guys who would fight in school, later on, you'll hear this man die on the weekend. Um, and I, I feel like around that time, uh, 2005, 2006, uh, that around that time you just started hearing more guys getting stabbed or shot um, I, I believe that it was around that time and uh you know i i feel a connection to both uh sides i feel a connection to the older generation because those days me growing up uh people would stop me on the street and be like yo don't do that you know i i have those experiences of uh, just friends of the family would see me and be like, yo, what are you doing here? Why are you here? You know, and check in. Um, but I'm also part of that ge generation where uh, guys who drive in the cars and stuff will come to school. Um, next, you know, we were walking over to the gym and get those and then I drive by hopping, blah, 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 right there. You know, um, so I, I, I part of a, a boat and I, I, I've seen kind of that transition happen from junior high to high school. Uh, we just start hearing more of people getting shot and people getting stabbed and dying. Um, and so I, I feel like that's around the time where it just started to spike, you know. Digby. Um, you know, growing up in rock, I think one of my pet peeves has always been, you know what, narrative in the voice answers. I think Croy, Walter St. Thomas. Oh <laughs> At one time, I remember we were trying to prove who had. St. Croix would have some madness go on, Rock have some madness go on. So, you yeah. know, misguided reality of what defines manhood. Manhood was defined as how gangster you are. And yeah. oh, you guys, mortals, were a little bit more outlandish. This starts going up in St. Croix when you are starting to see this transition happen, man. All right. Um, so I grew up in Mombiju and uh, French Japan, you know. So um, for me, most of my life, I saw things happening. You know what I mean? In the 90s, we glamorized being a Dan man. You know, who got a big chin, who got a set in the car. That's what was cool. You know what I mean? Um, so to me, there was never when it wasn't there. I was born in 1982. I graduated in 2000. When I was in high school, you know, the things that we thought was cool was like, oh, we got, we, we, we got a moderate. You know what I mean? We got the biggest moderate for capital. We's bad man. We ain't scared of nobody. You know, um, and you grew up with that there. Um, I lost a lot of friends. My best friend, you know what I'm saying? He, he got murdered. And I lost a lot of friends over my lifetime. And I remember in 2014, reading a book and it was called 911 the extinction of the extinction of a black male and in that book it was discussing a lot about mentorship you know that a lot of times we growing up and the only people we've seen are cool or has money is jay-z is um is drug dealers that has chains we don't get to see doctors that, that looks like us 
when we could say, hey, look, this is what I want to be when I grow up. Because even when I was growing up, I look at a dad man as that's the way you make money. That's, that's how I could become someone. That's how I could buy a house. And so over time, when you have mentorship where, you know, God bless for teachers like Danny Detterville and Mr. Nelson, who they were actually able to show me like a different life, a different side of things, you know? And you start realizing there's like specific grades, like fourth grade, ninth grade, where you see the drop-offs change. You know, you see that when you start school, it's about 13 black, 13 students that are male. It's about 17 students that are female. And then you realize by the ninth grade, it's two students that are black males to 19 students that are females. And you're realizing that's where it's starting to happen. Like we don't have somebody that, to look up to on a constant basis that's telling us, hey, this is a right way to do it. You know what I mean? So for me in St. Croix, I mean, sad to say, it was it was continuous. And you see as it gets worse as major things that impact the economy starts to change it, you know, like when it has closed. Y'all remember that year right after it has closed, like it, it was it was hot. You know, people would people were dying. It, it was it was hot. And you realize now, now we have new people coming in. So now you have an influx of people who just came here and uh, you're starting to see it again. You know, you're hearing about all these things that are happening on um, the boardwalk and all over. And it's scary. I can't hear you, Peter. Senator James, um, it's interesting, Big, you say that because, um, like I said, growing up, you wanted to be a bad man. That, that, that was, that's who yeah. the girls wanted. Yes, that's who yeah. you know, um, yeah, Senator, we wanted to be rappers. Yeah. yeah. yeah just... Senator James, as a lawmaker, me and you have had some interesting discussions, man, because your, I guess, your upbringing or your pedigree is a little bit more on the ground <laughs> level compared to your more um, orthodox way of becoming a politician. Speak on your background from the sense of you are now a lawmaker, but a lot of these brothers you kind of grew up with and kind of cut from the same cloth. So to speak on how you saw that transition, like Big you were saying before. Well, good night, everyone. Happy holidays, and thank you, Mr. Bailey, for having me. Uh, it started with the introduction of cracking the black communities. And then I can see the series of movies that played a major role in helping with the introduction of cracking to the black communities. We had the movie New Jack City. We had Scarface. We had Belly. We had Shatters. And those movies played a major role in our black men's life. But specifically in the Caribbean, I would say Shatters. Shatters came out in 2002. I was in ninth grade. I graduated in, um, I was in uh, 10th grade. I graduated in 2005. And I can never forget when Shatters came out, everybody, specifically in the US Virgin Islands, around my age group wanted to be a bad man. And then we had influential artists playing a role in that movie. One of them is the Mali Brothers. We, I think we had Spraga Benz and we had several others. So that movie Shutters played a, a major role in the Caribbean when it came to the influence of black men when it comes to guns and violence. But we got to start back in the 80s when they had Scarface. We're speaking about a, a young immigrant coming to Florida, wanted to start a new life. So most of the people in the Caribbean watching that as a way to make a living. I could come to Florida, I could come to the States to and do the same thing and hustle, crack, cocaine, whatever the case may be. So if you want to really speak about where the Virgin Islands or the Caribbean went from hello, culture, to gangster city, I would say start off with the, started off with the movie Starface. Now, I born in 1987, so I wasn't born when Scarface came out. Scarface came out in 1983. So 1987, that's when I was born. But when it, when it comes to the movies that I may mention of, New Jack City, Scarface, Shutters and Belly, the one that played a major role in influencing me growing up is Belly, and then the next one is Shutters. And I have to reference the movie Belly because Belly had um, Nas in it and it had DMX. And in the 90s, DMX and Nas were very influential when it comes to the rap culture. 
And um, God bless his soul. I can't remember the name of the guy, but he played a role in Shatters as well. And he died, I think, about a year or two ago. I uh, can't remember his name. But he played a very major role in Shatters. He was in Belly too. And I must admit, when you hear the, the, the Jamaican accent, it sounds cool, but I still think that if you have accent, it's the best in the world. So when people hear these Jamaican accents and Wagwan and, and Bomba this and Bomba that, you know, people tend to, to gravitate towards those kind of things. So to, to answer your question of where we went wrong is the introduction of crack into the black community and the influence of these movies that I made mention of. Yes, sir. Pastor Monroe, you grew up in Tonki with Ross, one of our more, at that time, violent communities. I remember we lost a lot of classmates from Tonki. Hmm. Where did you see this shift occur? Because you wasn't as a man of the clock. <laughs> <laughs> De definitely not. Um, good evening to everyone. Listen, um, a lot of people don't know that I was born in Arosdale site, you know, in St. Croix, and uh, my father was a traveling evangelist. So after we uh, left St. Croix, we went over to St. Thomas. Uh, I got there, born in 74, got, got in St. Thomas uh, at least in 81 or 82, and we moved directly up to Tonki, um, up, up into to Building 8. And um, I think uh, for me, you know, I, I grew up in a home that had two parent, two Christian parents. One is a pastor and one is a first lady. Um, nine brothers and sisters, man. Um, you know, my brothers uh, who would go through our uh, one name in school, Monroe's, would be known by every teacher because by the time I get to school, you know, my te you know, the teachers had like seven of us already, you know, um, you know, Salah, Marcos, um, you know, all my, my elder sisters and brothers. And so for me, what, what kind of changed in my mind, um, I, I know for sure um, a lot of people who were selling drugs and who was, you know, the, the, the baddest of the baddest used to be up in Tonki um, over and over again. Um, and I saw that as a young boy, you know, I learned, I, I learned every reggae song just by being in the project, right? Never having to play it in my home. Um, learn about, you know, weed, blunt, everything, just because I live in Building 8. Um, and just being around the environment, right? Growing up part-time in Bavoni, going to BCB, going to Idorican. So you have that environment. But for me, I think what changed in the Virgin Islands was that the shooting that happened in Megan's Bay, um, I think that that brought in, um, at that point in time, I think it was the first drive-by shooting. Uh, and I, I think that as a boy, I, I think that that changed, just in the spirit of, of everything. When I, when I heard the news too as well, just, just a chill that came over as a young boy living in the VA, knowing you don't know that you're in poverty, right? Never heard about these things. See it on TV, but the hate actually happened in the Virgin Islands. I wasn't there for Fountain Valley, but for that to happen in Megan's Bay, that that shooting, uh, that that to me was the turning point uh, with the guns and the crime, and the, the level of of the callous of the violence that we had in the Virgin Islands. Thank you, sir, Mr. Smalls. Um. Hmm. I remember, like I said in, in our introduction, as clear as day, Dean, Robbie, Sibo, Gaddafi, Juice, Spring It, Gene. You guys, I remember being home, and it was all these police cars zooming around St. Thomas saying, Stay in your house, stay in your house. We're looking for smalls. Smalls. Um, you got drafted by the Cubs. I want to ask you an honest question. When you hear all of us speak, when you look at this 45, this, this murder rate, this, this gangster culture, and like I say, I'm real enough to tell you that when I was coming up, you guys were a standard. When, in whatever misguided way of what we deemed manhood and power, you guys epitomize that. In, 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 in our need for heroes, yeah. you guys became tragic heroes. Small, when did this, how do you go from getting drafted by the Cubs? Because why that's big is because when we was growing up, the Cubs and the Braves are our favorite teams because mm -hmm. that's the channels 
That used to come out. WGN and TBS. WGN. Was I'm like, right, the like, Why yeah. did, was I a Cubs fan? <laughs> now yeah. I know. Bobby, how in the hell did you go from that, that to that to this to to already. becoming this figure? Like, yeah. the only, like the only person that could probably attest as far as age group wise, and the panel right now will probably be Ross. That would be a wrong line enough, right? But like, like Senator James said, right, that he was saying that this whole thing started when. I mean, I don't normally keep up no whole lot of talk. I don't keep whoever knows, knows. Like the rest, I keep them guessing. But I think a panel like this is to educate people. More so, not ourselves, because we're stuck in our ways. But it's for the next generation of coming along that you could pick up seeds and, like, you know, and just grow off of it. Normally, I don't keep up this kind of conversation. But then now when, Senator James says, when crack came to the Virgin Island, I mean, do we have enough time? Okay, but when crack came to the Virgin Islands, my brother Sebo is the one introduced it. He didn't know what he was doing neither. He went on the run for a gun charge. He went New York, back in the all like that. Them new crack series, I can't say, remember the name. Uh, Snowfall. That's what they're talking about. It was the beginning in eighties. He went up there and, and come back, and all it was was a money maker. We never knew that you might end up on it yourself. Oh, everybody that had anything going on for themselves is wife, house, car, every fuck going on the drain because your para. Nobody knew that everybody was young. So in other words, like, no, no we don't talk about it. Nobody knew that because everybody was young and things like that. Everybody was in a learning process. It's later on in life you realize that, man, if I had noticed, but we never had nobody before us to show us, listen, how you deal with it? You know, boom, boom, boom. It was about making money. So, I mean, my story, imagine me, right? I excelling in sports from long. No, I'll take you back if you want to know about gangsterism. Before it was Adelita Cancrine, it was Wayne Aspinall School. I could remember, I got uh, my brother Eugene, I got my cousin Kito, the same that passed away, right? Boom, the man come and I, 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 I dangle in the ropes, you know, because I'm still in school as a sportsman, but the man, maybe just bad to the bone. It's like, whatever, well, boom, but we's family. And the man come by my classroom and what going on? I tell my teacher, I got to use the bathroom and never came back, you know. We're going west to go tea foul, like go to fight foul, like little Malungo, ain't nothing. Back in them time, nobody have no money. This, I talk about seventh grade. And then now, boom, next thing you know, we go cross the street. Eugene tell a t uh, one of the man them throw the football, he ain't want to throw it, right? Eugene got over, crack, attack, crack, next thing Eugene ain't punch in the back of your head. My gym teacher, I got to be with two fucking, with two, no, we don't talk about, with two um, pen, Eugene stabbing the teacher up the road, and then now Kito get a big rack with the other one and it's like, this is from like all the adolescents. So in other words, why trying to show you, like, because all of us grew up, grew up with proper home training. None of this, uh, none of our parents could have heard about them, would agree with it, you know. That wasn't part of the thing. It's what you do when you step off of the porch, unless you get the direction and the guidance. We never had nobody that went through nothing before our time to show you, listen, I, what are you doing? I go end up doing 20, 40, 30 years. We didn't have that. So as time go on, boom, I reach into ninth grade now. You know, I, I get a slap and a wrist, them and get so expelled from every school in the universe. But because of my my prowess and my baseball prowess and my potentials is why I always, I always got a slap and a wrist because I was bad, like as far as in the sport. So I was given like a second chance, a second chance instead of somebody putting the foot on my neck because I am no really no different. I, maybe I just know how to finesse a little different because I'm a little younger. And then I'm older. I reach in ninth grade now. When I reach in ninth grade now, my brother, the same one introduced. Boulders for your shoulders, crack for your back, coke for your poke, every kind of slang you would ever hear is like, in other words, I ain't ninth grade. And then now you've gone in there and you've seen money can, them four packet full of money and just like 20s can done. He invented that. Nobody never did that before Sebo. 
nobody could tell you that they did it before him. And he will be, he will come on the panel now and tell you he regret because you're not, you, you don't know what you're getting into because all of us was young. You live to regret it. And he introduces it. So then now for me, my plight was this like, what? what? I went away, like I was getting ready to go away in ninth grade. Again, a heap of money from no, the no money. And then now I go in a way playing was like pitching five, seven, no hitters consecutive. It's like nothing is but no, but you know, I like this line. I like this new line here. This thing that's starting up right now, as far as you could just hang, you get all the bad care of them, you get the most money, all of a sudden you get all the girl them. That different from when you were growing up. So in other words, like baseball, like in other words, I what moral of the story is the street stole my dreams. And I always, I, from the time I smile, my grandfather named me Roberto, Alpha Roberto Clemente, because, and I used to play baseball, baseball. I was the best at it, and I always saw myself in the major league, in the Hall of Fame, doing the same thing until the streets grab a hold of me. The law of the streets is so great, a lot of people don't know. All the people, are being, I, I, I wash my hand and I'm cheering. I ain't in that way. You don't know what they're going through. Like the, the life and the partying and the girl and the excitement will be something that's more feasible to them than being in a home and on a computer. You never know. But you just, you need the direction there. And that's where I, I went wrong. I mean, like, it ain't like I will say I went wrong, but that's where I went wrong for me. So when I gone away and I signed professionally and things like that, they, the street done gone with my dreams already, you know. I always playing baseball and still thinking about what's going on with these men, you know. I can't wait for the season to done so I could come back and lime and girl and, and boom, boom, and just wherever it is going on. And then now, you know, boom, come back. My brother, get when he get paralyzed. I was half season. I was half season in Atlanta by a phone booth, causing get killed in a car. My first cousin get killed in a car. I put my baseball career on hold and I say, because this thing never happened before. Because we invented this thing in St. Thomas. This hustle in St. Thomas and St. Croix, when it come to crack cocaine, is we did it. Nobody could never tell you. So in other words, you, you've been like, boom, and this is the first time you suffer a casualty. Causing get killed, Eugene, and the ground paralyzed, like you graze in the top of my head. I have season. No, man, I can't play baseball no more right now. I got to go deal with this, eh? Because it's loyalty. I mean, and like a lot of the time, your loyalty to be misguided that you don't know. But it's loyalty. It's not a fault of your own. Because that's your attribute. That's who you is. So, you know, so boom. Then, okay, well, you get over that. Eh? Then the next thing, my cousin get killed in the ghettos. It was over with for me. I know I was uh, assigned to go to jail because it wasn't going to happen in 18 months, two casualties. You understand? And... That's when it happened. And the thing I want, want to share with people, all of this say you can't go call a neighborhood and us retreat. Can't go Smith Bay or West can't go content. Oh, it never used to be like that. I started that. That ghettos can't go wrong. They feel and wrong. They feel can when they kill my cousin. It was like that. So I will take fall for that. With that tall fuck, it was never like that before. Because I always used to be individuality. Like, in other words, if you do me something and you live here and you live here, I won't see you, I won't see your cousin them. But it became a tough thing after that situation with my cousin. So, in other words, like when I hear, but you can't go here, and I, I don't hear this, I like the people around here, well, this person can't go here. It's like that was not the intended purpose of this situation, but it just ended up being that way because I get, I get snipped off early. Because, like, I, uh, well, boom, my cousin got killed in September. I ended up in jail in January. And it's just been a heap of clash and war between two different factors. And when I got in jail and I, I get sentenced to natural life, like, people inherit the beef. And it, it become like a catch on. Like, you know, you can't be seen here, you can't be seen there. But it was never like that before. And that wasn't the purpose. You know, like, even, like, uh, let me continue with, with my plight. Like, when they killed my cousin, right? I determined I wasn't accepting it because I don't take two casualties. It wasn't gonna go so. And I make it known. 
I end up like after the incident and so, right? Like for these for these youth man, them man, I think I could just go there, like everything will be all right. No, don't believe it be like it's an easy road. No, sir. Because you know, think these beef gonna be long living. Like in other words, if I defend it tough, I, I gonna defend it for as soon as you go to jail, the fuck the, the thing the over. It is just done. And you'll be like, what? Because you know why? Welcome to the big leagues. Everybody don't do what you don't do ten times over. So it's what do you have to offer now? So like in order what they need to be doing is trying to find a way not to go in there at all because it don't continue forever because this way this thing that they're dealing with out there and things like that is continue and listen do you know how much time i sit on in like i've been in jail for 25 years and i see these men coming with these x among the bodies under the belt right and it don't work for you in there you become a regular citizen all of a sudden but you are the man on the road so why not remain that why not change your ways? Because in there, you like, in other words, you're just a number. You're just an existence. And you become a burden to people. There's no profit. People will cut you off. Not to say, like, it'll happen with everybody, but could, you could imagine the amount of people that they had to go through this. Eh? Like, in other words, prison is not a wise investment. It's no, it, no come back out of this, eh? You know, so have, they, like, go ahead. Go ahead. I have a question. Listening to you, and I'm going to pose the questions to the rest of the panel. You guys I mean, can... if anybody have questions too, they could feel yes. free to ask too. Yes. Okay. I am. Um, when you said you and your brother started this, naturally, there's going to be some that would say, damn, we went from this beautiful paradise to now this madness. Not so paradise. I mean, okay, whether good, whether bad. I mean, if, if we plan it to save the use them, we can't worry about a stigma. A, like, you know, after all, we, you got to speak the truth. You got to leave in no way the foundation started in, a, in order to get a solution to the problem. So then oh, now... Robin, what, you think, a, go ahead. what climate you think basically open a door for that energy and you guys to start that. What was it? Was it lack of economic opportunity? What was it? It always been lack of that. It always been that. But then now it's like, this is a new thing. Back in the days, it used to be weed. If you get Jamaican weed, St. Vincent weed. If you are weed, man, it's just weed, weed, weed. If you could get a hundred pound user, man. But when crack, when cocaine come and it's seen like how I um, uh, think we're talking about with uh, Scarface, it was that kind of era, but it's just 32 and 16 square miles St. Thomas and St. Croix. But it's the same epidemic that happened stateside. It happened or globally happened right there at this, like, you know, within an 18 months span of time. But it was like that. Everybody was making money. Whether you were square, I don't study them wrong, you know. Don't listen to them wrong, you know. Money, you know. Everybody was making money. But it, it, when it comes down to the come down, it's just whoever started that to suffer the, 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 um, the consequences of in, introducing it. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. Um, Russ, I have a question for you, Russ. I heard you say something about Robbie that, that moved me. You said, man, I remember this guy. I remember the... The Cubs, I was like, I was so excited to see one of our own on that stage. When you hear Robbie discuss the genesis of how all this began and the climate that led to it, and you think about your nephew, what do you feel, man? Russ, I know you're honest. Listening to Robbie speak, what do you feel? Hey, well... <clears throat> It's two errors. It's two errors. And I think now, that time, 2000, the early 2000, I would say probably up to now, but the early 2000, a lot of people, a lot of the young men have heard about Robbie Smalls, Eugene Smalls, Sebo Smalls. By then, they was already in jail. But just like, like uh, Senator James said, that time where you had chateaus and all of these these uh, Caribbean gangster movies came out. 
people idolize that. And then of course, we had a, a documentary about Rabidem, the Island Boys, where they was doing, you know, they had a doc, doc, documentary about their lifestyle. So now they seen these gangster movies, they seen, uh, they hearing about Rabbi Smalls them and what they did. Everybody, like you said, everybody wants, wanted to be a gangster. You see what I'm saying? Everybody wants, wanted to be a gangster. So that, I, I would say that that's that, that era when, that's when my nephew died, it was an era where everybody wanted to idolize the past. Whereas me now, I was there when Rabbi Dem was doing a thing. I saw it, I saw the destruction. And at the time of my age, I, you know, we don't pass that. We're trying to, we're trying to overcome that. But it's like, like I say, it's, a, it's like a, 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 a wheel. It's like a wheel. Um, I would say that where I could say that I, I didn't do my part where that instead of we idolizing Rabbi Dem or what they did, we should have tell, I, I should have been more vocal where, hey man, you see what happened to these guys? Don't be like that or not even say, don't even say watch those type of stuff. We should have been more into that. Whereas then, you know, hey man, you saw the cover of um, such and such, the man on the cover, you know, idolizing these guys. So I think that's where we went wrong. Now, as far as my nephew um, being shot and killed, I would not, I would not say, not based on what Rabbi say, is all their fault. It's not their fault. Everybody go through their, their time, and you know what I'm saying. They paid, you know, Rabbi paid his dues, and uh, uh, for what they did, he just basically told us, "Hey, I didn't even say no. The crack ever started with them. I just start the whole flashiness." And the making money started with them. The, the, the crack era. I'm like, some of these stuff that he's telling me right now is like new to me. Huh? Right under the big tree, they get those. You see what I'm saying? So when he said the crack era, when Sibo started the crack era, I'm like, wow, like, I'm like, this interested. I think, you know, it's like some, somebody from the state, some Yankee dude from the state come down and introduce it to them man. And them man decided to like, hey, let me try it out, whatever, whatever, whatever. But um, I'm not trying to idolize or try to take away from what we try to do. But as far as what you were saying that, I would not blame Rabbi Dem for what have happened to my nephew. But I could understand where, where, where did we went wrong as a community. You see what I'm saying? Instead of idolizing them and calling people and say, hey, you see the magazine, I cannot be on the magazine, or you see, you see the <laughs> We should have... <laughs> Use, use us as a use us as a poster child of what not to be, not to be, not right. to be idolized. And That's I want, I mean, can can That's I carry over into? Not meaning to cut you off, but yeah. the thing where you're talking about your nephew and earlier you're looking retribution. That still don't bring him back. It right. still don't cure the problem. You're right. supposed to take your nephew situation and take it to the rest of the youth. Not talk about like you know what? Nobody, the only one person might get arrested. But then now that story could save 10 lives. Understood. If you don't, if you don't satisfy with just one person getting arrested for it and he got in jail and that's it, what about the 10 other people then that you could have just save with the story? Right. It ain't about how with retribution, it's about bringing direction to these Jews because they, they don't know nothing. I didn't right. know. I had to but learn you know, the hard way. So if I, know, I, could Robbie, my, I, I could use my story and my situation to let you know if I tell you a mouse could pull a truck, don't ask questions. Just hook him up because I've been through it. Right. And you know, That's Rabbi, I be old enough to know. Right. And I and, and I want to address this here too, that you know, back then, you know, before my nephew got killed in 2005, so many things, so many young men have died. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a, it wasn't until it happened to me when it happened when it happened to my family. Is when you feel it. That's when I feel it. You see what I'm saying? No, you know what I mean? And no. Again, the wheel is turning because we have people now in 2020 yeah. feel the same way, feel like guilt that, you know, they never really pay attention to what he name or what she named son that got killed until it happened to them. You see what I'm saying? So it's something that now that we have, we have to find out how can we kind of 
you know what I mean, bring this air together. We talk uh, about it, but we have to set, find a solution where- I want to say something that I realized since I come out. You remember when I went to my things with my brother and cousins and cousins and they did, my mother and, and everybody wasn't screaming, go kill them, you know. I used to, Kito ain't gonna want you to get in trouble. He ain't gonna want that day. He gonna flip over. They're trying to discourage you. Right now with this new generation of parents, if you kill my son, every friend that is his friend, go out and go kill people. So they're encouraging the violence mm. just for retribution alone. They ain't like this. I want to, Digby, I want to get some of the other panelists. Okay. Digby. Hey, what's up? Listening hey. to Ross <clears throat> and Smiles. Yeah. Of an older generation, but we are from the same generation. Yeah. Hear this insight of that background as a voice now in this new generation. I'm being cool. an entrepreneur. Where do you see the fall off from back then and how can we address and better now? I mean, I think it's clear like how we're falling off, you know what I mean? Um, I think there's a lot of different things that go into it. And me and you have had a lot of discussions. Why even look at the education department? When you look at things like social studies and what's being learned, you learn from a young age to go to war over land. You learn that that happened over over in time. And for me, I, I look at like things like education and the way it was taught to us, I think that has a very big part of it. And when you also look at the fact that, like you said, a lot for a lot of us, our grandparents, grandparents were enslaved and in that era. So when you think about things like generational wealth, we don't have generational wealth, but we are an American island where people who have generational wealth can come to this island, they could buy nice homes, they could get all these things. We don't have those opportunities. When I went to school, I don't remember really understanding financial aid. I didn't understand. I understood an academic scholarship, which that was an option for me. I understood a sports scholarship, which I couldn't get it. So the only other option is the military. So I think it's a lot of these factors that brew in when you add the pop culture, you add those other things into it. It's a, it's a disaster. It's a cyclone. You sit, you're sitting in a place where you don't see um, value in what you're doing. You know, even now when you look at what I do in the restaurant business, how many young chefs were able to, I mean, young cooks or that we, were, we weren't able to really get to because they weren't able to see food that they could relate to. You know, you growing up on where everybody eats at these burger places, it's all this sort of food, but the food doesn't look like you. You don't identify with it. And I think a lot of us not being able to identify with what we're seeing and being able to make success out of that, well, that makes you angry because you feel like you're not good enough. You know, and I think right now what changes is that we're able to communicate. You know, Mr. Smalls, man, I'm going to watch this over because I'm just taken by it. You know, just completely honest, man. And you start realizing, like, this is how the change comes. It comes from conversations. And then, you know, people like the Honorable Senator James, he's able to take this stuff and be able to make great, I mean, put it up, put it out more. And I'm, I'm just really excited about this. The fact that we're able to have these conversations and it's 2020. We could have had these conversations in 2010, but we weren't ready for it. You know, because who did, we didn't have people that like Peter Bailey, who I can look up to as a journalist and say now like, wow, this guy right here is topping what he does. How many young Virgin Islanders now are looking up to you and are using you as a role model? So now we got flipped because in the 80s, who was our role models? It had to be Mr. Smiles. It had to be, I was a Santana. It had to be the people that we were looking up to because those are the people who had money that were able to buy things. You go into birthday parties, my uncle is like pulling out money. Like I'm seeing hundred dollar bills. And I'm just sitting there like, wow. You know, we were able over time now to start changing the conversation. I think looking forward, that's the blessing, you know? My message to the youth. Mm. Because that's what I, I, I think that's what we hear about, right? For the next generation to come. I mean, I, I kind of got sidetracked a little bit by, you know, because it's so much thing that went on in my life. Sometimes it'll start one way, you go from first to sixth gear. And yeah. you miss where you're trying to get at. I mean, in my plight, it, when I tell you my cousin got killed and I got, I got shot five times in the back from the police. 
right? I had to run for my life, climb up balcony, go around the next side, and like climb over another side. And then now when I'm in hospital recovering from surgery, the same night, they just give me a bail. And when they realized I wasn't paralyzed, because when I get shot five times, when they come get me an ambulance, I, I was paralyzed. It was just contusions to the spine mm. that led them to make me think that I was paralyzed. As soon as I wake up after surgery, tube in my nose, choose in the King Kang Kung, choose all, tube all over the place and thing, and I walk down and leave a police officer by the door, gather me and call, and call my girl at the time and tell her, I are because everybody thought they were dead. As soon as I went back in the hospital room, right, they hit me at Demerol too for pain. Is mm -hmm. Judge Judge Swan, a stenographer, two prosecutor and two public defender that I never asked about in the hospital taking my bail the very next day. And I still this is hours later, you know. That's so much they didn't want me on the road because you were trying to prove a point. And my thing is I wouldn't hold them justifiable for it the, like and I, i'll get to that I, i'll get i'll get to the point that i'm making so in other words i put my i then surgery i walk and ask like they take me in, in the emergency room dr abba i don't call him like in other words because it's real life ain't like i call a name to call him but you're telling him my story dr abba who was a surgeon at that time i and darren foy he was a regular police at the time just standing up there by the door he ended up being chief of police or something like that. But he was an officer in 1994, January 9, 1994. He had just became a cadet, kind of. And he's standing up there, Dr. Abba coming and telling me, I am not going to look for no bullet. I'm just going to repair what need to repair because you don't kill three people. I like, boy, kill three people. Wait, when this happened, but it just been a big situation. You understand? I go into the, I go into the CAT scan room to see what's going on. The chief of police telling me some nice thing, but you ain't see this shoot me five times. Well, it's over with now. I said, well, I guess so. I gone in and the man checking on my finger. I want to pull off my finger because he hanging. They get a doctor. I ain't saying nothing no more. I wake up out of my surgery the next, like the following morning and walk down there to the North Station and tell my girl at the time, I okay. I ain't dead. Everybody thought like, they see me pick up five shots from the police, from four police officers. Right, so they thought he going to there. So I go and boom, I, I go back and lay on them. I hit me the demoral. Like I tell you, the judge wake me up because it was Judge Myers is who had given me $250,000 bail a morning. Right, them man take the bail within 12 hours in the hospital room. Them man ain't wait for me to reach court. I never saw the street again from January 9th until 25 years later because they were trying to prove a point. When I left the hospital, that man built up a steel door in third floor behind the bars and put me behind like that. When I behind like that, the one afternoon recovering, I might, might, might still get staples and thing. I hear a live radio broadcast, just like in audio, my sister gets shooting her head. So you, you imagine you as a youth man being in jail, you think you're the toughest gangster, endure this kind of pressure because me ain't done with you yet. That's just the beginning. That was just a couple months into. My situ my 25 years. You understand? I got to hear this. Uh, and then now the man get me locked down tight. Every time I move, every time I leave from the jail, the man pick me up and send me St. Croix, seven o'clock in the night. Me know where you going. Hmm. They don't want me in St. Thomas because somebody gonna break me out of jail in St. Thomas. So they send me St. Croix and they get me in a dungeon. Me and the mosquito them come friend, you know. <laughs> got they biting me so much. It's like, I know now. If I gonna be here, we're gonna know each other. And I've been down there for months and months and months. Every time I come from St. Croix to St. Thomas, they get the whole road shut down, like how they used to talk about, uh, what you name, um, Snyder? They're going to use the moving yeah, traffic. The like, shut down. That's how they used to do with me. But the thing is, with me, just two weeks before this in incident, I was a professional baseball player. You understand? So in other words, my point to them is, is like, to the youth, it's like I put myself in that situation that allow them to carry me that way. Like I, I, like I, I cause it for myself. You understand? So it, it like, and then now boom, I when that they done, I went to trial. They, they find they, they convict me. No, even before I went to trial, I never knew. Like I was like that. I know I was just somebody regular. Just don't do me nothing. Are we good enough? 
mean advantage us. I ain't that type of person that want to take. I not that ain't, ain't me. If you see me in the dark, Ali, you're gonna be you're gonna be safe. You're gonna feel safe all of a sudden. You check so in other words, like when I go on to trial, they get sniper on the courthouse roof with sniper rifle, police around the courthouse, they get DPNI in the water, they get this and that. All in, in an effort just to convict me because of we. You understand? I was the first person to uh, get hold out of that them same brother thing that I telling you about. I was the first one to get hold. So they made me an example. So it was just up for me, it was just up on me to just be able to deal with the pressure. I dealt with it. As soon as they convicted, the man shut down the 30 minutes later, sentenced me to natural life. Come, boom, boom. Straight down to the airport and a national guard plane, I was out of here, you know. Gone, you know. Like, mm -hmm. I talk with the National Guard playing them that they get, you ain't gonna see them in the middle and they see them in the side, like when you jump out there and a parachute, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, so my thing is, is like, for the youth, them, right, is like, you you able to go through this, eh? Because I know every youth out there, you ain't out there running the streets and things like that. You, you trying to make a name for yourself. Yeah. And the harder you go, will be the tougher the consequences. Mm -hmm. When it comes down, because you ain't gonna win, it's, it's like in the, in the streets, it's, it's only either or two results. I hear there you go, president. You know? Nobody don't retire a street man. You don't retire like an old man, like I've been in the street for 30 years, like in the streets going, you don't either dead or go to jail. So then, no, if you, okay, well, if you're dead, that's okay, well, you know how that will go. But can you deal with jail? A lot of the times, we from Virgin Island, like you, like you to talk about, like you know, we, we, we not scared. No, we not. At all, we ain't scared of nothing. We ain't scared of our own skin. But a lot of the time, we just get misconstrued. If we just don't care about nothing else, neither. Don't care what the problem we get ourselves in. We don't know that the situation you find yourself in will affect your girl, your mother, your kids, your grandmother, and everybody. You, the situation you put. In, that's their burden. When you when you ain't caring about yourself, people won't care about you. So you got to be considerate of other folks, of your people and the people them that love you. If, if you just don't care about yourself, because like that, I don't care. You don't hear that. I don't care. But what about what, what about your loved ones? They care about you. So no matter what you go through, if you're dead, they gotta bury you. If you go to jail, they gotta they, they gotta sustain you all these years when you're not caring. So you got to consider that ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So that's my message to the use them. Like in other words, like you know, like me and Ross and thing, we don't grow out. I hmm. uh, use another generation dumb. All of us set in our ways. All of us set in our ways. We ain't changing. All of us set in our ways. That ain't Rapid. gonna change. But it, it ain't for us. We don't know what we're dealing with. It's for the next generation that coming up to catch on. For the youth, them, the 15 and the 14 and the 13 and 16 year old, that's who I feel I like to be speaking to, you know, because the one them a little older, it look like them man don't make the bed wrong, hey, you know. And you I, know I, what, I, you say something, and Ross, you said something. Hold up, let me. Ross, you said something earlier, and I want to pose this question to um, the senator and Julius in a second. Our people like to say we talking, talking, talking. Let me explain the craft of why we're talking. We cannot come up with a solution if we don't have an understanding of what the hell is really going on. Robbie, you just gave us a lot of what's really going on. So I'm sitting back, just a fly in the wall. I keep hearing a commonality. Well, man, I didn't know which way to go. Man, these youths need somebody to talk to. In essence, solutions, right? We're talking so solutions. Every tongue how we do this series is based on gun violence and how we pre prevent it, these large issues. I have a challenge for the men of the voice now. I have a challenge for the men on this panel. If we're saying guidance is what's missing, our young men need mentors. Our young men need mentorship. As everybody says, sometimes it's just you telling a youth, Yo, don't do that. In 2021, I had discussed this with you, Robbie. If we have our men 
No, it is a political freedom of color. But I'm talking about us as the men of the Virgin Islands. If we decide, say, we're going to give four hours of our time to a youth man home, one hour a week, that could be a phone call, that could be a FaceTime, however we decide to structure the relationship. If we saying the youths need some guidance, I'm asking, I gonna do this myself in 2021. We need mentorship. We need mentorship. Four hours. You ain't losing nothing. You'll go to the bar, drink for four hours of your pan. Senator James, we've had discussions. You said, look, man, these young men need jobs. I agree. I'm of the belief when people got some money in the pocket, their self-esteem goes up, they're busy making money, life is okay. Angry people, they kill people. Senator James, you was a lawmaker. You heard Digby mention, and this is the truth. I gonna be, let, let's just be honest. We, we, we look at our Virgin Islands. As long as I can remember, man, and it's not a dig at anybody, but as long as I've been on this planet, the economic opportunities, and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about walking, no disrespect to people who are cashiers or the waiters at hotels. That's an honorable job. But for too long, those executive roles, the ownership of business, the ownership of everything in our territory, oh, that we could empower these young men and hire them and put money in their pocket. As long as I've been on this planet in the US Virgin Islands, that part of it was for a select few okay. in our territory. And for everybody else that's coming in here. Senator James is a lawmaker. How can we structure a system where these young men feel that tomorrow is a good day, so I got something to look forward to? If I wake up every day, I broke, I have no options and I don't can't self say tomorrow being better. I don't mind shooting nobody because I have nothing to look forward to. So Senator James, where can we go from here? Now we're talking solutions. Where can we go from here? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I like the fact that you're focusing on those solutions because I don't really believe in too much of the talking thing, but since that discussion, we have to talk. But when it comes to solution, I've been pushing for career and technical education ever since I became a senator. And I've been passed, I've been introduced legislation, introduced two pieces of legislation that speaks to providing additional funding for our career and technical education our centers in the U.S. Virgin Islands. But what we fail to understand is the workforce is oversaturated when it comes to degrees. There are so many people in the U.S. Virgin Islands right now with degrees and can't get jobs. However, there's a big void in the U.S. Virgin Islands when it comes to skills and trade men. And that is why we tend to see those people from Puerto Rico and contractors from all over the world, they come here, put in the bids, make the big millions of dollars, and then they leave. And the problem with, with, with that is once we focus on the youth rehabilitation center and St. Croix, because the key in the youth rehabilitation center is rehabilitation. If I had it my way, if I was a commissioner of human services, I would have run the YRC similar to like a boot camp environment. So these young men, we won't even want to come back there. And by the time you come out of there, we're going to rehabilitate you. But for that to happen, we have to place a strong focus on the educational programs and the vocational programs. I visited the YRC last year at an opportunity to visit uh, the young men there who are taking up the, the, the GED program. I had an opportunity recently to visit the Bureau of Corrections or specifically the Golden Grove facility. And upon my visit there, which was like, Four weeks ago, I met with the directors and instructors for the different educational and vocational programs. I even had an opportunity to go in the general population. And when I say the general population of the jail, we're talking about the part of the jail where the people are actually sentenced. And I had an opportunity to sit down in a, in a, in a table, or at a, at a table, and I spoke, I spoke to all the inmates. 
and I had a one-on-one -on -one with all of them. And most of them told me while sitting in there, they're basically idle. So mm -hmm. the vocational programs and the educational programs are basically underutilized. So I had an opportunity to speak with a mechanical instructor. I spoke with the individual who is running the educational program. And I committed myself to them that I will work hand in hand with them to make sure we appropriate more funds to make sure that these young men and women who are incarcerated will come out rehabilitated. Now, some might say, well, Javon, that's when they actually got locked up. What about preventing that? So to prevent that, I would like to focus more on the Ralph Whitley Skill Center that we have on St. Thomas and to give our young men and women who are in high school and junior high school an opportunity to learn a trade. And the same thing for the St. Croix Vocational School. My legislation speaks to providing additional funding for these schools. And some might say, well, Javon, how would I going to really solve the issues in the territory? Well, I took three years of vocational courses when I attended the St. Croix Vocational School or the St. Croix Educational Complex. As I graduated from the Educational Complex, I went straight into the refinery. I was 19 years old when I went into the refinery and I got trained as a process operator and I was making $23 an hour at 19 years old. And to be honest with you, at that point in my life, if I didn't have learned a trade in high school, I don't, I don't think I would have been where I'm at today because I was given an opportunity to use my mind and my hands. I am not into, I don't want to be a judge. I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't want to be a scientist, but I know that I'm good with my hands. And that is what we have to understand as leaders. Everybody is not, I won't say intellectuals, but everybody is not book smart. Most people in this world, especially our young men, they're good with their hands. That's how come we're so energetic in school and we fail to understand that there's another one size fit out. So people might watch a, a, rabbit, a roto smile and say, man's sporting on getting nowhere. Somebody might watch a, a, a Daddy Jones and say, well, oh, what Daddy Jones wearing about reading back son and what have you. People might watch a Pompa or a Bob Z or a Kylo and look down on those things. But from a very young age, you need to find out what a young man and woman want to get into and make sure we have those programs in the, in the school to make sure that we have more Julius Jackson, we have more Roboto Smiles, and not the bad Roboto Smiles, the good one, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure we have more Chef Dickies and more Pastor Manrose and more Peter Bailey and more Senator James. But I want you to understand the reason why I became Senator James today because I learned a trade. And I'm not afraid to say it. I got kicked out of school in 2004. And, and, and one of the persons who did that to me is now my colleague. Mm. And, um, I graduated in, graduated in 2005. But the reason why I graduated in 2005 because I had mentors. I had people like Mr. Robert. I had attorneys and individuals within my father's circle because my father was involved in politics. So suppose I didn't have a father like Jonathan James. My mom is a teacher. My mom has been teaching for over 25 years. My mom taught a lot of people in the community. Suppose I didn't have a mom like that. I would have been a bad man because I grew up in one of the baddest neighborhoods and I'm not going to place it on the record, but at the time when I was going through my changes in high school, that's when shutouts came out. And that is why I got kicked out of school because I was going down the wrong path. But what saved me is the band room. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Valrika Bryson. Dr. Varika Bryson played a major role in my life. Um, I, I, I was part of the fusion band. And then after I went into the fusion band, I started my own band in high school. Um, yeah, my first band were with Pompa. People don't know that. Before Pompa even went to extension, Pompa and I, we had our first band because I used to live in Castle Copley and Pompa lived in Peter's Rest. And we, his, his people from St. Kitts and my mother from St. Kitts. So we had like, this connection from a very young age. But if I didn't have that band to save me, if I didn't have those vocational courses, if I didn't have my father, friends mentoring me, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. So moving forward now, as far as solutions, that is where the Department of Sports, Parks and Recreation play a major role to make sure that the recreational centers are up to par. That is where the Department of Human Services play a role to make sure that the YRC is functioning as a rehabilitation center. So make sure that when these guys come back, or if these guys ever decide to come back, you're going to give them a living hell in YRC. It should be run like a boot camp. 
Because if you don't give them that feeling of a boot camping out in a YRC, they're looking forward to big jail because they'll say, well, well, are you ready for big jail? It's like a graduation, it's like a promotion. But you want to kind of build that fear in them that they don't want to come back, but at the same time, give them the option to learn a trade and to get their high school diploma. So when they get back into society, they don't be a burden. And last but not least, if, if I had it my way, if I was a commissioner of education, Mr. Smiles would have been coming to all the schools regularly. Like for real, I would, I would have put you on a payroll because they need to hear this story. So I said, well, oh, we want to hear from, from the, the, the people with the degrees or the people with, no, they need to hear this story. So they can know like, hey, we don't want to take that part. We want to make sure we make it to the big league. We want to make sure that we could be a team, Duncan, and we could make the Virgin Islands proud. And, and it's so funny, I remember by saying this, that when I was working for Senator Francis back in 2015, I came back home in 2014 after living in the state and I, I campaigned with Senator Francis and Senator Francis gave me a job. And I worked as an administrative assistant for Senator Francis. And while we working for Senator Francis, he had this party named Roboto Smiles. I also to write to Senator Francis. And I was the one that used to open the letters and read them. Wow. And before I even had the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Smart, I was reading about his story. And I, I know, no, mind, I don't know how he looked. I don't know anything about him. But I'm a person on Google. And when I went to Google his name, that's when I, I saw the documentary and all that stuff. And that's when I really started to learn about where we got, where we went wrong when it comes to Virgin Islands culture and the drug culture. And, and if we want to be afraid of speaking about it, we will never see the change. Mr. Roboto Smiles, if I had it my way, if I was a governor, if I was a commissioner of education, you'd have to pay more dues by going back out there and telling people this story, this story and to make sure that if you can't capture all, at least some, so we can have more people doing great things in this society. So those are my solutions. And, and some of the ways that we can move forward. Well, Senator, um, Robbie, one second. Where is it? I would like to add to that for a second. You know, like sometimes, you know, I, you know, because of certain things you might do, you might gain a certain amount of respect and things like that. They want to be out there, people watch you in a sort. I would give all of that back to have a second chance. Trust and believe that. So in other words, like, you know, I respect what you're saying, Senator James and so, but in other words, I just see myself when it comes to the next generation youth that growing up and emulating the gangster raps and this and that. Use me as a coaster child, what not to be, not to be like me, try to be better than me. I don't want no credit because I had all the opportunities in the world. I had my, I had the role paid for me. And just because of the law of the streets, it wasn't rap music. Now it, they just hearing it in the air and just riding with what because it's song good. No, back in the days you had to really live it in on the on the pavement. And I did it on the pavement. So in other words, don't listen to talk. Talk don't move you. You got to it, all the choices you make in life determines your destiny. And that's my message to them. Don't be like me. Be be better than me. You know, use me as an example. Thanks, Robbie. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. Pardon. You uh, I, would just, I would just end by saying this, uh, Mr. Smiles, um, just to make sure that we, we, we clear it, um, I would have you as a big brother, and not just for talk sake, but to actually, for those guys, you know, because you could relate to some of those guys. You could do what some of those guidance counselors cannot do. You can go into their inner soul and bring out that goodness in them. So I just want to let you know that's where it, which angle I was coming from. Yes. On mute. Robbie, on mute. Like, when I first came out, right, I mean, I'll say this to the wall. I don't think I was released out of prison because I did 25 years. There's a heap of man that doing 40 something, if you're looking for compassionate plea, that's, that wasn't my purpose that I envisioned and was in my plight. I, I figured that my experience and my story could save lives and everybody adapted to it. So in other words, boom, and I was granted clemency for it. But in order for me to succeed, guess what I need? The tools in order to do so. Other than that, you just lose me out there just to figure it out. I don't have the capital. It's the government. Like in other words, just all, I get all the ideas, but I need a bucket. 
So I don't know, I just out there talking to deaf ears. You just falling and deaf ears. I, I want to be able to show you what I'm talking about because I did it in Golden Grove. I came back in 2009 from being at uh, nine different prisons and I start to run into man and the ground dead and I got to stick my finger in the chest and and the, and the dying in my hand when the officers them running and seeing the blood and they shot in half and leaving me and other people, to, other inmates to deal with it. I came up with solutions to the problem. I realized just like Golden Grove, but the only thing Golden Grove is not 32 and 16. It's just a little small about everybody is from St. Thomas, St. John and St. Croix. So in other words, it come idleness. We just start to watch each other. We ain't got nothing to do and it create a, a, a hostile, volatile situation. So what are you going to do? I can come up with different incentives in order for you to get something to look forward to. That's when I came up with the different programs, the Ironman program, the basketball tournaments, and this, and I get teams coming from all over, UVI, the Olympic team coming to play. And then now you're allowed to get 50 guests. So you get to see your family. You, you have an just something simple. Having an opportunity to see your family in jail, it, 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 like it made other inmates police each other. Let's just cool out. We don't want nothing to happen. We, we want to shut this down. Or oh, I ain't going to get in trouble because I don't want to be in hold. And it went from murders, escape, and stabbings to who doing these positive things in the jail. But I know because this, this was my community for now. Because I wasn't sentenced to 23 years, like I coming out in 18 months. I was sentenced to natural life. So whether it's in whether it's in Russia, China, or Japan or St. Croix, this is where you're gonna be for the first summer. And if this place is all right, I want to make it as cool as possible. And I didn't have the money. I had to solicit donations from Plaza, from my partner, them, wherever they just they just adapt whatever cars that I into and they just do, donated money. I was never all the BOC did was sign off on it and allowed me to do it. But when it came down to making it happen, I had to do it on myself. But I didn't care. It's because I got to live here. Just like in jail, I got to live out here right now too. You think I want to be ducking from gunshot one of these nights? I don't want to have to do that. Same like in jail. I don't want to be pressing my, my hand in your chest trying to save your life. I try to prevent that. But you, you, it's idleness. The island don't have nothing. So uh, for when these men graduate from high school, if they do, and you know how much of them men that's in jail, that I meet the, them youngsters that don't graduate from high school, or they were in 11 and a half, 11 and a half grade, like they were on the way to 12 grade, but they just get in trouble. Like they're smart, they ain't stupid, but they just like, when you graduate, it's either you go, you, you, better, have a, you better be a genius to get an academic scholarship. That don't happen much, right? or you go to the military. Other than that, there's nothing else. There's no workforce for you if you want to have a regular job around here in the streets of St. Thomas. Other than that, what you have to do? Resort to what all your father them doing and nine times out of 10 is the streets. Mm -hmm. It's the streets and the survival because your mother ain't gonna take care of you forever. You're 18 years old and you better fend for yourself. So what are you gonna do? If you don't have no opportunities for you out there, what are you going to do? Right. Julius, you, um. Julius, yeah? On me. Um, you work with a lot of at-risk kids. And like I say, obviously, we, we, we gain back the mentorship. We gain back the guidance. And like I say, Senator James, you're here. Men of the Virgin Islands. I know there's a lot of bureaucracy, Senator. I know a lot of times when you want when political wheels, you know, it, it's nothing personal, but the political system has bureaucracy. It's a process. I'm saying that I'm here. I'm sure there's some brothers out here that decide, look, we're going to sign up our time. You give us a youth man, and we're going to play that big brother role. Actually, there's a lady, Rachel Samuel De, De Castro. She wrote in the comments something real powerful. She said, um, I feel this great discussion will move towards actions. Does St. Thomas have a big brother program? Like I said, a lot of this stuff, is bureaucracy red tape, but I think we as men, we could take on that initiative without that bureaucracy. Senator James, I would love if there's a program set in stone, we need mentorship for these young men. Julius, you've been a mentor. How has that experience been and how do you see just a simple, let's be honest, if you got two youth man, fight it. If he gonna shoot somebody, man, he has somebody to call right before he go do it. Man, he has somebody to call. 
just to talk to. That's a more that we could have stopped. How do you feel, Julius, your experience with mentorship is helping, is actually to stop this issue, these issues in our community? Um, well, it's, it's a real complex thing. Um, I think that's, that's uh, part of what Robbie and Senator Jane was saying, that it, it, it's complex. You know, there's different uh, areas that affect different men and different people. Um, you know, we need a lot of work in a lot of areas. Um, but when it comes down to just mentoring and uh, coming to the level of some of these youths that we have in our community, um, me and myself, I've learned a lot. Um, I thank God for my brother's workshop every day because I, I generally won't have the, the opportunity to meet so many young people in that setting. I see them every, every day, five days a week. Um, we work together and we talk. I get to you know teach them things, uh, not just in the culinary field, right? I get to teach them by just talking. We talk about music, just life. Um, and a lot of the stories that I get from these guys uh, it's some of the conditions that they live in. I, I don't even know how they're coming to the workshop every day. I don't know. And it's amazing to see uh, the things that we can go through. But what we, what we uh, have at, the, at my brother's workshop is a team that uh, we look at the complex of the, the, the human, the person. Um, a lot of our kids deal with trauma very early, very early. They, they're experiencing trauma almost every day, either in their home or just in their neighborhood. Uh, you know, guys just have guns out and will just shoot in the air, blah, 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 and they shot right in the head, you know, and they just like, it become normal to them, you know, it become normal. Uh, <laughs> some of the things, some of them raising their little brothers and sisters, you know, they don't have, they don't have a social, they don't, they, their parents said, look, I'm going to walk. You got to do this. This is what you got to do. Uh, and, and hearing those things from them, first of all, uh, getting to the point to hear that from them is a step. Building a relationship to the point where uh, they're like, you know what? I want to tell this older person I really don't know, right? I, might, I, I, might, I have a little advantage because they probably hear about me or, or hear my name. Uh, you know, and they'll be like, you know what, I, I'm going to share this with him. Reaching that point is a, is a big step uh, in, these, in, 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 a, in anybody's life, really, to, to grow that relationship. And then uh, from there, you kind of make a, a, a kind of a, a leeway inside their, their world in their brain. You know, uh, some of them see things different. You know, two people could be talking in a car, right? I make a joke about maybe something fall on the floor. In that kid's mind, because of what he's been through, they're talking about me. I know they're talking about me. Nobody could tell me they ain't talking about me. And I have to tell, I have to pull guys outside and be like, yo, listen, they was not talking about you. Hmm. I know you might have feel it. I, I see you see it with the mouth. I know you might have think that, but something fell on the floor and that's what they're laughing about. You know, I already had to pick up guys out of the bakery and take them off from fighting. A guy from outside come to fight a guy in the bakery. And I, I thought they were joking at first. I swear they knew each other and they're joking. And he like, yeah, yeah, come inside, man. The man come inside. And I said, you, I said, no, man, this is, a, this is a real thing. I had to pick up the dude. I said, yo, you got to respect this place. And you got to respect this place. And I, and I think that's, that's another thing too. Uh, you know, I could have just picked up the phone and called the police, you know, and watch them fight, you know. But uh, I think we in the community, and, and this is not just... Uh, because I am in pro that's just because me I, I felt like I had to intervene like this was my job my job was to make sure nothing happened with the two of them I said brother you want to waste your time right now you want to waste your life doing something stupid like this why you know he's like I can respect and I can respect and he walk off but I think those kind of things in the community we need to do more of and and that's just rather than sitting back you know taking taking a step um, because of the relationships that um, I'm forming at my brother's workshop and talking to these guys, I also realized another thing is we have to support these guys sometimes, even if we don't feel like that ain't where you should go, right? Even if we don't feel like that. Like, let's, for example, I have a couple guys that, that 
really believe they'll make it as rappers, mm -hmm. right? They really believe so. And I, they don't know how hard it is, right? Peter, you know, you know, you have a lot of guys in the industry, you know, it's really hard. And so I wouldn't say that. I can say, all right, let's, you ever been to the studio? No, mm -hmm. let's go. I would sponsor your time at the studio and let's see what you got. You know, I take two, I take about five guys to the studio one day. Only two of them went on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Respect that. Only two went on the mic, but they had the chance to do it. They had the chance. And they keep asking me, let's go back again. I say, you're sure? Because you didn't went the first time he went, <laughs> you went on it. But he has something to look forward to, you know? And, and he see me support him, you know, regardless, regardless. Um, I, I think those things go a long way. And I, I think that we all can do that in our own circles. I think that's where it matters the most, though. Mm -hmm. In our circles is where it's going to matter the most. You know what I'm saying? Um, the people that we see and who see us and we know each other, they, you know, we have a connection. They would hear from us more than just a stranger. They would hear, they would listen more than just, you know, a regular Joe from anyways. Um a small story about, about about Robbie. Robbie, we actually had a FaceTime. I don't know if Robbie remember this. We did a little FaceTime. Um, a good friend of ours, Tony Rosario. Um, no I am on tournament when I come over here. <laughs> and your brother came over there for I am on tournament. The same yeah, thing. I came yeah, but even before that, we had spoke, and yes. um, that was that was uh, huge because I grew up hearing the stories. You know, I grew up hearing it. You saw the documentary, and. When I spoke to Robbie, the, the, the passion that came out of him, uh, that stuck with me. Like, that stick with me. I, I know he was like, listen, I don't want to see none of you doing none of that while we're doing it. You hear me? I, I, my chance gets stolen from me. My chance was gone. And that's, that stick with me, you know? And uh, that, that, that was huge. That was huge to hear. And so I, I really feel like it's important. Um, you know, some people might say talking don't work, but laying these things out and saying these things sometimes could go a long, long way. Um, I tell that to my guys. Can I, can, I, can I, like, hold on. I mean, I'll pick you back after that, big um, brother, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's 32 and 16 square miles, as opposed to being living in Miami, Atlanta, these youths find themselves in situation. They might be at a club tonight and you get into a little skirmish, whatever. Might not be nothing tonight, you know. But next week, Correct. like, okay, well, do you live in Buckhead, McDonough, wherever, all over the place? But in St. Thomas, all roads lead to the next spot. The next jam, everybody gonna have to meet up again. So, in other words, you got to put up or you, 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 you got to shut up. And the thing is, is like, like, you know, in real life, I might not want to kill you, you know. Trust and believe I don't want to kill you, you know. But greater than that, guess what I don't want to do? Is die. Everybody got guns. So I might take the initiative because I know you and your people, them, is known for this. And we get into a situation and then I will go to jail and regret it. I will end up in jail and regret the action that I took. Just taking a preemptive measure because I just think everybody bad. I might not want to do you nothing. I would like to walk away, but just depending on how your, ad, your, your, your adversary moving is what you're forced to because, you, you know, it's so small and congested and everybody want to be bad. So in other words, what are you going to do? And you bad too. You know, what are you going to do? It's either it's, it's survival or the fittest. And, you know, that the society that we're supposed to be able to grow up in. The society ain't supposed to be able to shape who we are as a person. Everybody's supposed to be able to rise about every situation, but you know, that's easier said than done, especially when you're done older. Not for these 16, 17, 15 year old that just banned the other day, unless they get somebody to tell them about it. Other than that, they left to just figure it out on their own and they're going to resort to violence or death or jail or all of that because they don't know nothing else. I, we didn't have nobody to tell us, listen, what, what you were doing? If I, listen, I stopped that day. I just come from doing 20-something years. If I continue, I, we didn't have that. I could tell you that they know, or we could tell you that they right now, because we live it. It didn't have nobody else before our time that went through all of that. 
So in other words, you in other words, you got to like I would like to be used, like like used with ED, like you know as a as a tool to you know divert to use them. Whoever it is want to uh, that grown in their ways and things like that, and they don't say that's your business. I can't change you. But these for these other ones that coming up right now, that's who I live that don't know nothing yet. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just want to end end with this. Um, just 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 to say that uh, I think in our own circles, uh, we should speak up. Just say something, you know. Um, just just make a move, make a move in a direction where somebody know that the, you thinking about them. Uh, yes. You know, you care. I think a, a lack of carelessness uh, in our community kind of spreads. It spreads fast. You know, and um, I think if we could just show that we care, you know, um, I don't know you yet, but I care about you. Me know you at all. But I, I don't have to know you. Exactly. It's like the essence of getting back to community. I've said this before. We only got 100,000 people. Don't tell me you got about five, six youth men out there terrorizing a whole community and nobody in the community have access to talk to these youth men. Somebody got a cousin, an aunt, somebody. They got, five, they got five or six in every spot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pass them on rules. That's the difference. It, like, you know, it's just to reach out to them and lead them know because trust and believe you on prison. Like, you know, like people will watch it on TV and swear that's like, and I could do that day. Like, ah, prison is the most sharpest existence that you could ever endure in your life. That's a retarded existence. Mm. You ain't about being tough, like, oh, I got to go through this, I got to fight. No, you just in there, like, like they said, watching your clock every day while the wall just revolving and continuing and life goes on and you in there just wasting time over some bullshit that could have been prevented. Like, you know, even though it might rise to a certain level, but then now it, it always starts somewhere. Mm. It always starts minute and then it rises to something that you know, it, it, that as an explosion, but it always it don't just start as an explosion. So in other words, you got to always think. Mm. You know, you got that that is it, not cool. You know, jail ain't cool. Right. Jail ain't like the tough. Like you know, people are think that man jail. I, I got I got like you know they say I got you, you can't drop your soap. That man will stop you. No, know, it is not like that. Like in the movies, you're just stuck in there every day in the room. Like all day, you're just there for twenty three hours in a room. Mm. You want to live like that because a lot of the time you try to convince, like, you know, authorities will, I could remember, you want to go to jail, you drop your soap, that man going to rape you, and somebody going to do you something, and like, you know, who, nobody going to do me nothing. I bad as I could be. I dare somebody to do me something so that would never prevent you from wanting to go jail or, or ducking anything that would allow you to go jail. But difference, just think about being in a, in a closet for 23 hours a day for 25 or 20 years, no? You want to do that, eh? I, I think not. They're going to make you think different because it ain't like it ain't going to happen different for you. They're going to do it to you too because it's happening to everybody once you allow them to put you in custody. You don't you don't have no more control over that. Your life is in their hands until you can find a way out. You know, so why even go through that as a youth man? I mean, I went to jail when I was 23. I was in a prime. I did more than my life in jail. I did 20. I went to jail 23 and did 25. Mm -hmm. Talking about squandered opportunities and wasted time. Well, we're making up for that time now. Monroe's. Uh, it, it, it ain't over, it ain't over, you know? Exactly. Monroe, what do you have to add? Yeah, um, a, a lot of things to unpack, um, you know. Uh, you know, no, and I want to say to uh, Robbie Smalls too as well, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, but you, you got to remember that you see the gray hair over here? Yeah. So you, you, you got to... Okay, okay, all right. That's why you are. I was just seeing Sild alone with the gray. Okay, you're looking young. Hold on, no. You're just going with some little gray on the top of your head. You're looking like a... That's, that's a compliment if it's only here alone. I see like an old man. That's a compliment I gave you. <laughs> you <laughs> let me know that you know. <laughs> Thank you for your compliments. All right, okay, all right. um, de definitely. Good to be look young too as well. Um, yeah. but, but a lot of things that he said, you know, I, I would not put a lot of the things on, on Robbie Small. I know that he's saying that. But listen, he, he did not change the way the parent parent, right? 
Mm -hmm. uh, he did not change the way how I feel in the third grade, I feel in the seventh grade. Um, he, he did not cause me to fail. Um, he did not call the Department of Education uh, to have one of the biggest budgets in the Virgin Islands, and yet still we can't crank out people, young men especially, um, on, on a reading level. Uh, he, he did not, you know, divest from the Virgin Islands, right? Uh, he did not uh, um, appoint and select all of the senators and the governors who was put into office who did not do the right job by the Virgin Islands. Robbie Small did not do that. We did that as a community. And so for me, I think that, you know, Robbie Smalls, his message and what he's saying today, um, uh, I, I have been, of course, you know, I tell people all the time that I've never done jail time. And, and, and I always tell my brothers when I go into prison or when I talk in ministry, um, you know, I'm 16 years in the pulpit as my senior pastor. I pastor four churches. Um, but, but what I would always say is that sometimes when I talk to young people, and I talked to them about the fact that you, the same message that Robbie's given, the, the difference is that I have never done the time, but I understand the experience just because of my position in terms of people that I serve and I mentor and I help. You know, I have, I have a nonprofit organization and our goal is to work on reducing gun violence, uh, not only in Brooklyn, but we, we're just releasing a national platform for, for clergy, especially specifically to take back that space um, in America because we believe that our communities especially the Virgin Islands, can exist without violence, right? The level of violence in which we, we see. Violence that is unabated. Violence that does not have a triad. Violence that is not really uh, put to the right place to, to really help so that that next shooting will not take place. And so what I want to say is that without a Robbie Small, there will not be a Guilford Monroe's, right? In, in terms of the fact that in the same thing that he is saying is what I did and I went to Bible school uh, 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 to become a preacher and a minister for that same influence. So, so, so I saw these things in the Virgin Islands and I said to myself that I want to make a difference. And, and that's why I became who I became, thank God. Now, I did have a gun in my hand. I did fire a gun, but only by the grace of God, the bullet that was in the chamber, when I pointed to my friend, I actually moved the gun away. And the bullet went through on my floor and, and went through the, the, uh, the closet um, um, in Bavoni, Este Bavoni, where, where we live currently. So, so, so I was just a, a maybe a feet away from where he would, uh, would um, ha have been in terms of doing jail time, having a gun in your hand, having that type of influence. None of us really and truly was isolated from a lot of things that he have said. So I don't want you to think that, that, that because, you know, I'm a pastor now means that we are not going through the, the same struggle. Uh, again, you have to understand that, you know, growing up in RSDS High, being born in, in that community, moving to St. Thomas, growing up in Tonkey, um, you know, meeting your brothers in, in Tonkey, Bill and Ed, you know, with Russell, we went to the same class, um, you know, Almac being part, I used to play playing basketball, Anna's Retreat, you know, Hidden Valley, you know, um, so, so we, we went through all of those things together. But I want to say that Robbie Small did not do all that he's saying that he's doing, I don't want, I want to give you credit, but I don't want to give you all the credit. We are in the Virgin Islands have to also take credit for parenting, for governance of young men. We also take, have to take responsibility for investment into the Virgin Islands to bring in the economics that we need back in the Virgin Islands. And I want to close with this. I have offered in terms of my uh, ministry and, and the way that I look at things, um, I remember, and I tell Peter this all the time, listen, I am not a... I'm not Rock City. I'm not Tim Duncan, right? I'm, I'm a professional pastor. In other words, that's what I do. I've started four nonprofit organizations. My nonprofit organization in New York City, I'm the first, the first person, clergy, to be funded by the state of New York uh, um, and the city of New York to do gun violence work. The first one in the history of New York City. So when I said to them, listen, I said that I want to be able to come back home and to help. So, Peter, I'm, I'm going to be very political, Senator James. And so we have suggested, and I have suggested, and, and Robbie, what you are doing is what we call critical, crit, uh, critical um, um, cr um, messengers. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not critical messengers. Uh, I slip in my mind. But yeah. credible, sorry. Credible messengers, my bad. Credible messengers that we have to take people like yourself. We have to hire you, and we have to allow you to do the work that you're going to do. You are a credible messenger. 
And what we need in the Virgin Islands is to be able to take people with your story and put them back on the street to tell your story so that young people can really relate to what you're doing. So I have done this. Listen, myself, you know, Senator Myron Jackson of Fort Well with UVI University, uh, we have put together a bill that will create what every community is doing. Today, New Jersey is releasing one of the biggest police reform, defund the police idea is what you're saying is taking money from police departments around the United States of America and putting it into social programs so that people like yourself could get back in the street because we can never police our way out of what we have in, in, in the Virgin Islands. You can't lock up all of the Robbie Smalls because Robbie Small went into prison and we still had mayhem on the street because every time that you put somebody a Robbie Small in, another one take over and he say he leading the posse in Mombaju or somebody's down east or west. So, so, so what we have to do is that senator james don't don't let people put you in a corner to say like oh what are we going to do with people who are not in in who, who how do we serve people uh before they get to jail we all have to do something because when you were born there was already a murder happening in the virgin islands so no matter what you do and what bill you're going to pass you must deal with the people in prison because they're coming outside. So you're not going to say, don't feel any way that to say, well, people will say, well, what happened? No, let another person deal with the people who are outside of the jail. Let my brother's workshop deal with those individuals. And you write the bill that you feel is best and necessary because it's not one thing that is going to help us. It takes all of us in so many different platforms. Last thing and I'm done. I have proposed... Uh, through Senator Jackson's office, what I think could be one of the most important legislation because it's working across all countries. It, it, I, I am releasing right now um, panels and, and Virgin Islands, what we call Clergy for Safe Cities Across America. This is a national platform that will be led out of our organization that deals specifically with this, a holistic approach to dealing with the violence. What does that mean? My recommendation to the, to the Virgin Islands is this. This is, this is my give on this platform tonight. Is that you must have a central place to deal with the violence in our community. And did you notice that we didn't talk about taking guns off the street tonight? Anybody notice that? Anybody realize that we didn't talk about put uh, jail or more police officers on the street? Did anybody realize that? Because we know that is not a solution. Because guns don't, don't kill people. People but that is not the solution for the Virgin Islands. The only solution, yes, police have its place. But what we need now is a social connect, a comprehensive approach that brings together, like Senator James said, he mentioned Parks Department, Health Department, um, uh, 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 music, um, you know, um, cooking. We have a chef on, we have broadcast on, we have a senator on. We have a boxer, we have um, uh, a, a baseball player who is now incarcerated, who left there and now is, a, is, is, a, is an activist. We have um, a, a professional producer on TV, right? You have a pastor who is on. That means to say that the way that we tackle the crime must be a comprehensive approach. So why would we not try to pass one of the best bills that I think that every state is passing, if you look at any research, is a comprehensive uh, platform that pulls together an office that brings all of this together. If the bill, the Virgin Islands bill to create the Office of Gun Violence had passed, Roberto Smalls would have been one of the first people who we would have used because the bill seeks to have people specifically like him, not only him, but multiple other individuals to take them, create a program and put them back. He's worrying about funding. We will deal with that for him. He, he, he spent 25 years in jail. He don't know about all of the laws. That's our job, who have been going to school and doing the work for 25 years, to support the brother who was in jail for 25 years. I want to submit to the Virgin Islands. They call me crazy, but I think that that's one of the best bills that we could pass in the Virgin Islands to help triage the, the, the gun violence problem. A place where we can centralize, put all of our resources together, to tackle those among us and that's what i think so and i'm going to always think so thank you pastor well folks we're winding down and with every town hall we go around the panel with everyone's cl closing words i like to say that um i want to thank all all you fellas and you know i know we from rock we from cruz we from st john from water island we vi but i ain't gonna tell all you brother to brother i love each one of Everyone are you because 
we, I know we live in black girl. This is the year of the woman, right? I support our sisters, but we are the men in our community. And I'm sorry, but I think when we see our young men, we have to handle that as men. So I just want to thank everybody that took the time out to be on this panel, because for me, I heard one of the people in the comments said, it's so great to see Caribbean men together speaking unified. And, and, and um, this is great. <laughs> You know, um, so I'm going to go around the room with the final thoughts. And the question posed for your final thoughts is, what do you see yourself as a man, as a leader, as a protector in this community? What do you feel your vision for 2021 as a man in this community? What do you want to see for our community? What do you want to see for the young men? And where do you see your role in that transformation of our islands. Julius? Um, well, I want to say thank you, Peter, for, for um, creating this platform and, and thank you everybody for joining, everybody in the live. Um, uh, for 2021, I'd just like to see a lot of growth, man. Um, you know, this year has kind of put a lot of things on hold. Um, a lot of people, you know, on setbacks and, you know, financially, career-wise, uh, just the movement has kind of not been progressive this year. Um, but I want to see that uh, big time, you know, for, for everybody next year. Uh, for me, um, you know, I have a little nest there at, at my cafe. I have a little nest of young people that I, I, I'm focusing on. And um, I, I really uh, want to take more time and spend to push them, just put getting get those little pushes. Um, you know, uh, I, I sometimes hire some of them to work with me um, at some of the villas and some of the private caterings I do, some of the events, some of the online shows that I do. Um, and I wanna do that more because even if they don't wanna be a, a chef or, you know, a, uh, I don't know what I call myself, a creator, an author or whatever, all the stuff that I am. <laughs> uh, even if they don't want to be any of that stuff, um, it just gives them a, a look into something different. You know, it gives them uh, a look into something pro uh, progressive. It gives them a look into something that's happening, you know, something that's uh, making money, something that is, uh, you know, uplifting, it's positive, um, and just bringing more along with me. And then uh, they can find their niche and they can feel empowered. They can feel uh, that, they can reach that. They see it right in front of them. You know, they can ask me questions right there. They can talk to me about it. Um, I want to do that more uh, as, as much as I can and um, and help in that way, help the community that way and just uh, exposing because a lot of us aren't exposed to that side. Um, you know, I, I brought some kids to my house up north side. They've never been north side. You know, never see the view from north side, never see the ocean from north side, never been on a boat, you know. Um, and just exposing them uh, to that thing, uh, to that side of life and seeing that, you know, there's a lot out there, man. There's a lot out there for us and it's right there for us to grab. So um, that's what I want to do more in, of in 2021. Thanks, Jules. Say to James. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Mr. Peter Balian the rest of the individuals who are here tonight and those who are listening for participating in the conversation, whether it was through the panelists or through the comment section. But I just want to say this. I, hear, I, I listen to all the solutions and the entire discussion and I agree with 99.9999% of everything I would say tonight. The rest point, whatever 1%, we deal with at another time. But I don't want us to underestimate what the crack epidemic did to people, people of color. And up to this very day, we are still suffering because of the crack era. Because with the crack era, for every person that consume crack, those individuals basically can um, produce babies as well. And the side effects passed on to some of the children who we have here today. So we have kind of like crap babies and, and, and not to be funny, but we, we do have crap babies today. 
And until we study re what really happened in the crap epidemic or the crap era, we will never be able to solve our issues here today. Because up to this very day, crack and cocaine is an is a underworld. And I won't go too deep in it because I'm not a law enforcement officer. I let the policemen do their job. But it plays a big role in the, in the black community, the Hispanic community. And we live in a, a society or a community where we do have those people amongst us. And you know, we live right next to the door to some individuals. But that's a whole other story that the police officers got to deal with. But until we start to deal with that and study the crack era, we're going to have some real issues. And that's why I want to make sure that in the 24th legislature of the Virgin Islands, that my colleagues and I push for a mental health facility because we do need a mental health facility so individuals can be able to detect. We still have individuals there who are consuming these hard drugs and suffering because of that. And with the Big Brother program, I have been doing that. I started the Super Dad Tree for All movement. I've been collaborating with many others because I cannot do by myself. So if Julia Jackson tell me, tell me, Senator James, I need to come to St. Thomas and vice versa. I need Julia Jackson to come to St. Clark. Digby, I need to come over. Roberto Smith. We need to do that because if any one person on this panel here could say that I can beat by myself, count me out. It takes all of us collaborating with people from our walks of life, whether they might be a, a, a past crackhead or incarcerated in the past. Once we know for sure that person is trying and we have people like Mr. Smiles who can sit here and say, look at me now. A Senator James who could say, look at me now, I got kicked out of school. I, I was a part of that. Look at me now. Once we have individuals who change their life along with individuals who didn't take that part and understand that part, like Pastor Monroe and, and Mr. Bailey, and we bridge that gap, we will be just fine. But don't underestimate the crack era and the introduction of crack and cocaine, because it still has a domino effect on what's going on here in the territory. But that's a whole nother story. But I just want to see a mental health facility and a facility where individuals can be able to detox and we can truly rehabilitate them moving forward in the 34th legislature of the Virgin And to pass the Monroe's, I will support the bill for Senator Jackson because the good thing about it is give it a try and if it doesn't work we know what to do so i will give it a try rules your final words i know you gave them bad speech but final words pastor uh, listen um you know the the virgin islands my my mother lives at home um my sisters my brothers um you know th this is this is our home so i, I am pledging tonight to I really redouble my efforts to help faith leaders understand the role in this community. I think that the faith leaders, um, um, primarily in the Virgin Islands, have a, a large group of young people, business individuals, um, attending their congregations, and I think that we need to um, have them at the rightful place. And, and I think that in, in 2021, I want to redouble my efforts to get that done. I think that a lot of time when people look at clergy, uh, especially um, activists, well, well, a lot of clergy is not considered activists, like, like I'm considered an activist or an advocate, especially for gun violence. Um, but, but I think that that's a space that we have to kind of reclaim in the Virgin Islands. It's not about being religious or being spiritual. It's just being morally correct and aligned. And, and, and so that's very important. I don't think that anyone on this panel, anyone who's listening, would, would, would not agree that we should live in the Virgin Islands, that every young man should be able to live past 25 and that your daughter should not be raped, and that you should be able to walk the streets without being killed. And that's a moral imperative for the Virgin Islands. And so the more that we say that from our pulpit and the more that we, we look at it from, from our moral standpoint, I think it helps in the conversation uh, that, that we know that we have a specific role to play as faith leaders. So um, those of you who are specifically working around young people, I will support you. I, I, I would stand with you, but we don't want to leave a gap. And I think that where God is calling me and where my vision is and where my passion is, is to really deal with faith leaders, to really stand uh, to, the, to the challenge of filling the gap, standing in the wall, be the moral voice, helping the Virgin Islands come out of where, we from, where we are. I am very hopeful tonight um, as I look at this panel. I, I feel hopeful uh, because in your voice and in your eyes, I see hope. I see myself. 
And not only that, I see the future of the Virgin Islands. So, so thank you, Peter, for having me as part of this tonight. Thank you. Ross, final words? Again, um, Peter, I want to just thank you again for having me on this panel. Um, a, lot, a lot of information. I know that, you know, time, time. I know a lot of, a, a lot of people probably say that we could go on and on. I know Robbie have a lot to say. But, you know, hopefully I could get you on my show, Ravi, in the near future. <laughs> we could talk more about it. Not not, not about, just solutions. So the solutions. Anytime, anytime, yeah. anytime. No problem. Man. But um, my what i looking forward for 2021, again, i focusing on myself, focusing on myself, trying to get myself better as a person. Although we here, we have work to do, I have my show and, and entertaining people, whatever, you still have to get your mind right, get yourself right. And health, you know what I'm saying? Health is a big thing for me right now. You know what I'm saying? I'm going up to age. So that's something that I'm, I'm looking at too. Get myself, you know, when you get your mind right, your health right, you know, you can focus much better. Um, what are the things that I look forward for the Virgin Islands, uh, my people? I want my people to educate themselves. Educate yourself. Educate yourself. Get your mind right. We focus in on too much of the negativity, too much of here, say, street, street uh, stuff. Focus more about, you know, get your mind right, help, you know, get facts, get just get your mind right, educate yourself to mental slavery. You know what I'm saying? We, 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 we too bonded into the crabs in a barrel mentality. And I just hope that we start focusing more and think, God, we got a lot of work, man. We got a lot of work in the Virgin Islands to do, especially with the, you know, situation with, with, with the GRS situation. Of course, we still have the pandemic situation, which that, that's, that is serious. You know what I'm saying? That is very serious. So I think we need to start focusing more about things that matters more than things that don't matter. And I, I and I as a as a talk show host, as a human being, I fall short. I fall short. I I you know get into that as well, you know, on focus. But for the most part, I just hope that my people, which is a is a long shot, but I just hope that we we could get our mind right and stop glorifying um, negativity, uh, hopefully that we could, you know, put a kind of a, a, a hold to this gun violence, man, because this gun violence is getting out of hand. I know we didn't touch on a lot of things. We just talked most about uh, Robbie Small situations and and some of our highlights of what we went through. But I, ho I hope that on the next 2021, we could focus more about gun violence as far as like getting really into the situation, you know, as far as gun, the, the word gun, G-U-N. Where is it coming from? How is it coming to the Virgin Islands? We don't have no manufacturer in the, in the Virgin Islands, nor in the Caribbean for gun. How is it coming in? We all know how it's coming in, but we need to talk about that more. You know what I'm saying? I know it's a touchy subject. I know people is very uncomfortable because, you know, it's a lot of people, there's a lot in stake, there's a lot going on. But if we want to be serious about it and real about it, we need to talk about it. You know what I'm saying? Put, you know, if you have to, if you have to pull your, your friend out and blast, do what you gotta do. But we, we have a serious problem where young men are getting killed. Like I said in my show like, uh, on Friday night, you know what I'm saying? The, the, you know, the men are the future of tomorrow. If they're dying, if we're filling up the cemeteries with young with young men, where I mean, where the production, where the reproduction gonna be? I mean, what, you know what I'm saying? So we have to we have to focus on that that gun that that war G U N. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If we want to really seriously get, you know, get a, a hold of this this gun violence situation in Virginia. Thank you again, Peter Bailey, man. Much love to you. Much love to everybody on this panel, man. I salute you all, man, for what you are doing. Keep doing your thing. Hopefully, in the near future, we could, you know, everybody could chop it up. We could chop it up or do a revise or whatever, man. All right? 
Digby. Final thoughts. Yeah, first, uh, yeah, thanks, Peter, for uh, bringing everybody together and everybody on this panel for sharing, like, so much great information that I really feel like this is a start. This is this is where we're going to go from here. And I don't think anybody that was on this panel is just going to leave this and just wander off. I think we're all going to be on that same path where we want to do more. I'm um, sorry about that. Um, for me, I, I want to see more mentorship. Let's get in there and start talking to kids more. Let's do this more. I know it's COVID-19, so it's kind of hard to get people together. But let's work on it. Let's have more conversations. I think we could reach out to more kids and we could change more lives. You know what I mean? Because I think we all know that it works. You know, when I talk, to, when I when I hear from Mr. Smalls and Julius, when they're talking about how they're mentoring these kids and they're at the grassroots level, you know, they're there one on one with them. And I think those are the changes that we're going to all have to make. I think we need more men in the community to be to be mentors and to be examples so we could empower and show these kids that we believe in them and give them hope because I can tell you I didn't see that growing up until someone showed me that it was not it's not learned it's not a uh, instinct it's a learned behavior so I think that's uh that's let's come together and do it for, do it for the youths you know we always say the children are the future but then we always find something more important to do so me personally, um, I love what Senator Javon James said with, um, with the Big Brother programs. Count me in. I'm there right off the bat. Whatever you need, I'll start. If you need me to start cooking to bring people together or maybe it's doing a class or I, I don't know. I'll be creative. Whatever we got to do, let's just see if we could bring people together and let them see if we could change things. Mr. Smalls, final thoughts. For me, I've done this a few times, whether in, whether out, the panel. I, like, for me, I don't play. I don't just, when it comes to the use them, I really want better for them. You understand? So, like, what he, I piggyback off of what he just said. Let's not just have a wrong table discussion and then tomorrow it goes nowhere, you know? Because I done been down that road before. And, like, in other words, it's like, how do you divorce them from, into their situation, you got to lead by example. My message right now, right now, uh, my closing is not for the youths, it's for we, the older ones, them. Like, in other words, we got to make the way. They just learning, you know, the kids is just learning. So then now, all of these different mentorship programs and everything that we actually speaking about and trying to get a better man for them, we have to actually put it in for effect and let's just talk about it because for tonight, it sounds good. And I trust, I really song, I trust this panel because it sounds different. Because I've been there a lot of times since I come out. Sometimes it, it'll take the, the win out of my sales sometimes with so much, like, you know, give up ideas and then share my story and it goes nowhere. And then now you're back to square one until the next person come along. And then at, at the same time, within these months, people falling off, people dying, kids is like, going astray, or they getting ready to go to jail, or they getting ready to die, because these little one year that spent just on their own idol is when they, they're getting to mischief. So in other words, let we really get together, right, and make a difference, not just talk about making a difference. And so I ain't gonna like give message to the youth and what need to be done about gun violence. We could sit down and discuss what needs to be done, because if no one, I could never come up and give you a one solution for it. Right. All six of us with six ideas could probably solve the problem, but I can't just tell you no one idea, but we need to come together and focus our attention on the, the next generation that come in if we want to save the Virgin Islands, you know, because everybody will point the finger at the problem and this and that, and, and, but they can't come up with a solution. I've been in jail for so much years and I hear him like, because, oh, I wash my hand and then you'd man, then you'd man different out there. And I'm like, well, how did it happen? I was a youth man, it's because you give up. You actually give up because like how, um, uh, what, uh, what your name says about the crack era, it's true. Like, you know, they come up with a different kind of mentality because your people have been under drugs for true. You know, so you come up under a different kind of breed and your mind done gone as a child, but that don't mean that you're gone forever. You just need direction. You know, everybody, like, you know, I came up with home training. Everybody came up with home training. 
your your parents them wasn't promised this like they inherited this drug they didn't know what they were doing either as well just like the the person that was manufacturing and distributing they didn't know neither but you know there's was, was nobody at fault that was then what do we do now we could point fingers forever back in the days and 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 hold people responsible but that you dying on change that what is we going to do now in 2021 we're going to still pointing fingers and blame others that gonna get old after a while you know so my message in like, you know, it's like, let we come together, like, you know, as a community, like you say, take a community to raise a child, like, for real, in a literal sense, it really does. Like, you know, you know, let we do it then. You, you get a right panel, you get, you get a legislature, you get a pastor, you get a, a professional athlete, you get um, um, oh. a chef, you get you, you get Ross, that is, you know, oh. do, do you need more? You oh. don't need much more. Indeed. You know, uh, so that's my message. Let me do something instead of talking about it. Mr. Smiles, I think by now, the Virgin Islands community, anybody close to me, whether I'm Miami, wherever I live, reside, know I'm a man of action. Um, and like you said, this panel feel different because it is different. Yeah. Um, on this note, I just want to thank everybody for this tuning in to the last day USVI Town Hall. Um, our partners that supported this, that, that that's integral in the mud with this, the office of Senator Myron Jackson, our folks at VIA. Um, this is a community effort, man. And I'll say this, put it on me, Virgin Islands, if next year all we did was talk, put it on me. Call me a hypocrite. Call me a, a windbag. But I'll tell you this, I live for my legacy. To the end of this day, we're all going to leave here. What did we do? How we live on is who we inspired. And the people lives we helped to change. And uh, for me, this is a great night. Because they say people from the VI is crabbing in a bucket. We don't support each other. We can't unite. Dying YC right here tonight. You know what I'm saying? YC here tonight was the men in our community Nobody jealous, nobody cutting off each other. We are on a common ground trying to save our home, which in my opinion is the best place on God's green earth. So on that note, I love all of you. Day USVI, VI forever. Peace, love, and blessing.